there are people who are neurologically damaged who have physiological reasons for difficulty in maintaining optimized attentional focus. You see that in people, for example, who have fetal alcohol syndrome. Most of the time, as far as I'm concerned, it's a rubbish diagnosis. Panksepp, who investigated play behavior in rats, also noted, this is quite fun, that if you deprive juvenile male rats of the opportunity to play boisterously, they become hyperactive. And also, if you deprive them of the opportunity to play optimally, their prefrontal cortices do not mature well. The prefrontal cortex matures late and it constitutes, in some sense, the pinnacle of neurological development and it needs to develop in the course of intense play. And then he noticed that if you administered hyperactive play-deprived rats amphetamine, Ritalin, that it would inhibit their frenetic playing. And that's pretty much what's happening in schools. The schools are not well adapted to boys. I don't think they're particularly well adapted to girls either, by the way. But they're particularly not well adapted to boys. Boys aren't designed to sit still and be bored out of their skulls for seven hours a day. There are boys with particular temperaments who are even less inclined to be able to do that. If you're extroverted, highly social, possessed by a fair bit of enthusiasm and positive emotion, then you're going to appear more hyperactive. If you're creative, then your attention is going to be fragmented in some sense by the multiplicity of your interests. So if you're creative and extroverted, then you have both of those working against you in terms of your quiescent adaptation to the school environment. If you're disagreeable, which is also more likely if you're male, then you're quite likely to push back against what you see as stupid arbitrary rules. And so we know perfectly well, for example, that attention deficit disorder overlaps with childhood conduct disorder and antisocial behavior. And I'm not saying that all children diagnosed with hyperactivity are conduct disordered. I'm saying that more aggressive boys tend to manifest symptoms that sometimes tilt them towards juvenile criminality and sometimes tilt them towards attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity, but it's partly their somewhat rebellious temperament. And so if you're disagreeable and extroverted and creative, well, then why wouldn't you be hyperactive? When amphetamines were first used to treat hyperactivity, the hypothesis was kids who are hyperactive or attention deficit disordered are of a different neurological type. Now, as I said, in rare circumstances, that's true. But absent evidence for neurological dysfunction, I would hesitate to make that presumption. The run-of-the-mill hyperactive boy, if you put him on amphetamines, his attentional focus improves. Now, the original hypothesis was that's because these abnormally neurologically structured hyperactive boys have a paradoxical reaction to amphetamine administration. It calms them down, whereas with normal people, they become more stimulated. There's a word for that theory, and the word is wrong. More intelligent and differentiated analysis has indicated that if you give any child amphetamines, the grip of what they're attending to is stronger. So all children are calmed down by stimulants perversely because the psychomotor stimulant, which is a dopamine agonist, which activates the focal exploratory system, does increase the capacity for focal attention. But it does that with all children. And so a positive reaction to amphetamine in relationship to attentional focus is no indication what Whatsoever, even in the most minute manner, that the diagnosis was correct. And so, I don't buy it, except in these rare cases, is that we use amphetamines to conveniently modify the behavior of bored boys, because we're too stupid to construct our education systems in a manner that doesn't drive them mad. University students take Ritalin like mad in university, because they learn that they can sustain attention, whether that's productive or not in the long run is a whole different issue, but they can sustain attention with less effort if they use amphetamines. Now, that's a degenerating game, fundamentally, like most drug use. And I suppose if it's very carefully regulated and the doses are low, then the negative consequences are less dramatic. But I think the whole thing's just, it's a psychosocial fraud. Hyperactivity is an I iatrogenic disease created by schools. That's, that's the case. So boys should play more, way more than they do, way more.
They should play to the point of exhaustion in some sense every day. Really, really. They'll quit when they've had enough. It's definitely overdiagnosed. It's a very unreliable psychiatric diagnosis. Many psychiatric diagnoses are unreliable, and that's because psychiatric diagnoses aren't precisely scientific categories. They're weird hybrids, right? First of all, psychiatrists aren't scientists, they're engineers. Engineers are trying to do something rather than to describe the objective world, and psychiatrists are trying to make people healthy, whatever that means. It's actually partly ethical. It's very complicated. We don't know how to distinguish it from temperamental variation. So for example, if you're high in openness and high in extroversion, low in agreeableness, conscientiousness, and high in neuroticism, you're likely to manifest symptoms of ADHD. It's because you're exploratory, you don't like to sit down, you're full of ideas, your attention scatters across a wide variety of topics, and you're not very stable. Temperamental variation is also much more common among boys. If you deprive young rats of rough and tumble play, which is what the young boys are deprived of in school, let's say, they get hyperactive, then their prefrontal cortexes don't develop very well because they're not having the right kind of experiences and that you can treat that quite effectively with psychomotor stimulants like Ritalin. So that's kind of an interesting bit of scientific information that no one pays any attention to. There is also absolutely no evidence whatsoever that long-term use of psychomotor stimulants produces increases in cognitive gain. Zero. And there's plenty of evidence that it's harmful. The school systems that most of you attended with their rows of desks and their buzzers and their bells and their recesses are basically factory structures that emerged from the Industrial Revolution that were characteristic of the way that working people who worked in factories organized their lives. So the bells that go off between periods and to announce that it's noon and to tell you that school's out, those are factory bells. You can see echoes of Freud's idea that the superego and the ego and the id are in conflict by imagining, for example, how difficult it is for a very active six-year-old, especially if they're male, to sit quietly and regulate themselves by the bell for six or seven hours, you know, when they first go to grade one. You know, Freud would say, if he was alive, that the reason that so many people have attention deficit disorder is because the demands of the superego, so to speak, in the school system are so excessive that the clash produces pathology. Now, the pathology is obviously defined by the situation. If you define pathology as being unable to sit down and pay attention to things that are deadly boring while you should be running around playing and having fun and wearing yourself to a frazzle, then that's pathology. That's attention deficit disorder. And you can treat it with Ritalin, but that's only because you can treat anybody with Ritalin, you know, as I'm sure many of you know. You know, Ritalin is an amphetamine and it makes you focus more on whatever you happen to be focused on, though there's no real evidence that it provides any boost in academic achievement over any reasonable amount of time. But if you think about it that way, you see, you can understand what Freud meant by this superego versus ego conflict or the superego ego id conflict. Attention deficit disorder is a perfect example of that. And then the pathology is defined defined by the circumstance. If we didn't have schools that are like the schools we have, we wouldn't have attention deficit disorder as a pathology. Now, and people like to think about it as a scientific category. You know, it's a disease. Disease is like an objective entity. It's like, well, no, it's not a disease and it's not an objective entity. It's a sociocultural construction. However, there are certain people who are going to be more prone to be diagnosed with it than others. And that would mostly be open extroverted kids because they're not gonna sit down and shut up because they can't. They're extremely curious. And mostly what they wanna do is talk to everyone and play. Now, Panksepp, Jack Panksepp, Jack Panksepp actually, has done really interesting experiments with male rats and he showed that if you deprive male juvenile rats of rough and tumble play their prefrontal cortex doesn't mature which is also a real hats off to Piaget's theory of play as critical for higher levels of development and that you can you can also inhibit their tendency to play using Ritalin it's pretty sad it's, in fact, it's appalling, really. When I see people in my clinical practice fairly frequently who come in and said, well, they were diagnosed with ADHD when they were like four or whatever, it's like great, you know, pathetic. It's pathetic that that happens.